going through this 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 book. The only problem is, I I took just your book. I didn't take the Tao with me also, right? So I'm like, oh man, I messed up. But I don't have enough arms, right? <laughs> to to you know. And now my little table where I am now, I don't have enough room to have my notebook, the Tao, and who wrote the Tao. Anyhow, so we are live. Hello, everyone. This is Dwight Woods, the Jeet Kune Do Rebel, and welcome to an extra special Monday uh, episode of the Jeet Kune Do Dialogues with none other than James Bishop, who is fast becoming one of my favorite JKD people of all time. All right. Uh, this is his second appearance, and he is here to share with us uh, what I would call momentous, spectacular news on his latest entry in the historical Bruce Lee library, I guess we could call it, with this fantastic book, The Tao of Jeet Kune Do. I have to tell you one thing, James. I wish that I had two copies because there's so much writing and highlighting I have to do in this. But you were gracious enough to send me uh, 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 an advanced copy, and I really appreciate it. So welcome back to the Jeet Kune Do Dialogues. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. And as far as a, a second copy, you're going to get a second copy. Ah. Uh, the the first one was an uncorrected proof, so as you know, there were some error, typographical errors in it. Um, so I will make sure that you get a finalized version of the book. Well, I I, I appreciate that, um, but I mean, I am I am off the wall with 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 this thing. Um, but let let's start with this. What is it that you want to say? to readers, potential non-readers, and maybe even detractors of who wrote the Tao? Um, I think that probably this is the most important scholarly work that's been done on the subject of Jeet Kune Do and Bruce Lee in probably 20 years um, since the Bruce Lee Library series. Mm -hmm. Since its publication in 1975, the Tao of Jeet Kune Do has become the best-selling martial art book of all time. I suspect it sold over a million copies. I could not find exact numbers. Yeah. Um, why is been, that? Think? Why, 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 why can't those numbers be tracked? Well, they, they might be available if I were to ask the publisher, but you know, there's nothing online that I could find uh, uh, okay. that would confirm that. Now, I know it's been through X number of printings, and I know that uh, I think, I think 40, 45 printings or something, right? Yeah, and I think the last, the highest number I saw was from several years ago, and it was something like close to 800,000 copies sold. So I think it's probably crossed the threshold of a million copies. How Easily, many languages? How many languages? Um, I'm trying to remember. It's in the book. I think there's at least 15 languages that it's been translated. Wow. wow. Yeah. I know who has a copy of each language. <laughs> In fact, he provided me photographs of the various. I copies. saw that and I thought, hmm, I think I've seen this picture before, but I, 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 I wanted to be sure. Um, and uh, he wrote the foreword for it. Mm -hmm. right? Okay. Yes. And in, in case people don't know, we're talking about my, my good friend and sparring partner, uh, Richard Torres. Right. Um, yes, correct. You know, yeah, we, we, we go at it. Um, but I think we go at it simply because we're both passionate about the art and about the founder and about our instructors. And so um, I think it's good that people can see that, that, that there's discussion and there's debate and there's back and forth, but it's all done with a view towards um, increasing the amount of knowledge that there is about Bruce Lee and Jeet Kune Do, which is exactly what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You, you yes. know, I, I mean, and it's 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 incredible. But now you you mentioned in the book that there are people who are going to accuse you of being a Bruce Lee basher. Why are you? I know that you're not. But tell us why you are not, in fact, a Bruce Lee basher. Well, as I stated in the book, you know, Bruce Lee remains one of the biggest influences on my life. Um, you know, discovering him changed the trajectory of my life in the sense that um, I started looking at furthering myself, developing myself. That included my education. 
Yeah. Um, it, led, it led to my field of expertise, which is studying uh, tremendously gifted and talented people, uh, which I got my doctorate in that subject. Um, so, you know, far from, you know, trying to diminish Bruce, I'm trying to put him in the proper historical context. Right. Uh, which means, you know, if he didn't write these things, then the authors who did deserve to be noticed. Yeah. Right. Deserve to be acknowledged. And it's also an opportunity for people who can now see this to go and explore those authors and see what other wisdom they can gain from those authors that, you know, perhaps Bruce didn't write about. Um, so, uh, but I think anytime there is a, a level of, on one hand, criticism um, leveled at Bruce, then there are people that are going to suggest that, you know, you're just trying to bash him. Um, and not all of this is necessarily criticism. A lot of it's just correcting the historical record. Uh, but regardless, I think a lot of people don't like their their view of Bruce to be manipulated in any way uh, beyond what they kind of already have made up their minds about him, mm -hmm. right? Or, or even challenged, right? Right, not yeah. challenged, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I expect some people will, you know, probably try to lump me in the category with some other people in the past that have had some criticism of, of Bruce. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I'm quick to point out that, you know, he's probably the biggest influence on me uh, in my adult life. Uh, so... And, and now most people, when they make that statement, he's the biggest mm -hmm. influence, are referring, if not completely, they're referring primarily to martial art practice, aren't they? Yes. But you're to not martial arts or a sense of fandom. Uh -huh. you know, they, right. they may, they're, either, they're either a martial artist or there's someone who may not be a martial artist but loves his movies. Mm -hmm. You know, wants to collect all the merchandise, things like mm -hmm. that. I'm, yeah, right. I'm not that. I'm not that type of person. In fact, Richard the other day, I complimented complimented him on being a great Bruce Lee historian. He said, "Well, so are you." And I said, "No, I'm not a Bruce Lee historian. That's not what I do. Right? I have a specific area of scholarship, which is his writings and the philosophy. Yeah, uh, but I'm not. I'm not concerned with." with the, you know, minutia of his daily life, the dates and facts. In fact, this, that bookshelf you see behind me, that's the entirety of my Bruce Lee collection uh, in that one bookshelf there. Um, so well, I'm not, yeah, yeah so, I, would not, uh, I would not call myself a historian. Yeah, well, right? I mean, like, so, I don't know, I can't tell you offhand what his birth date is, right? Okay, right. Nor yeah. can I tell you his shoe size, but right. Yeah. Yeah, well, comparatively, anybody's bookcase will shrink in comparison to, you know, to Richard Torres's collections. Because I mean, yes. incredible, in, in, in and he serves he serves a valuable purpose, and that's yeah. why he's been a tremendous help in preparation of this book. You know, because mm -hmm. you know there were some books that I had a hard time locating, uh, particularly some of these boxing books and and fencing books. Uh, yeah. They're not easy to come by. Um, and I would reach out to, to Richard and I'd say, do you happen to have this particular book? And a lot of times he did. And he was able to, you know, take pictures of the book, the pages and stuff like right. that. For, uh, some other types of guy. In some cases, he even pointed out some, uh, some sources of some of these quotes that I was not aware of. So uh, uh, he's been a tremendous help. Yeah. Yeah. And when I needed, I needed pictures of something, right. you know, he was quick to provide them. He's he he again, you know, and 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 I'm I'm sure that I'm sure that uh, that there are some people close to him who are annoyed by the way that he and I go back and forth. But I'll say it, I'll say it out loud. He he is an awesome person. He's like you just said. He's a valuable person in in the JKD world. You know, it's just on some stuff he and I don't see eye to eye. Just as you don't see eye to eye, I gather with uh the the bruce lee estate in, in in terms of like the expanded edition has the expanded edition did it remove I'm, I'm trying to remember did it remove the attributions or no it didn't remove them it moved them from the front to the back or something yeah so so 
just a little background for people who don't know. In in the front of the um, in front of the Tao of Jeet Kune Do, on the first page was a list of acknowledgments, and they were they were the result of uh, someone named Joe Snyder, who I write about in my book. Yeah, we got to talk uh, about him. Who who discovered some initial mis misattributions um, and made the estate aware of it. And as a result of that, they had to halt publication of the book um, in early, in late 1975, early 1976 mm -hmm. uh, to get permission and clear that up legally with the, with the authors and the estates of the authors um, that he, the information he provided for them. Um, and so that acknowledgement has been there for most of the life of the book. Yeah. Um, but when the expanded edition was was produced, that acknowledgement had been quietly removed from the front of the book to the very back. Um, and I take issue with that because it, it seems like it was intentionally hid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. In in and did they did they add? more names to the attributions because they had found out no it was it was so there's been other you know there was a, a a select set i think it was the uh it was it was hazlet right uh, i think um the costellos might have been in there yeah, it was pretty much the boxing and the fencing attributions Pro, right yeah crotier's um yeah. contributions yeah. Uh, that were mentioned in there, things like Dempsey, I don't think was in the acknowledgments, but we've known for a very long time right. that Jack Chris, Dempsey's Chris writings in that book, yeah. Yeah. and that has never been added. Uh, so they're, they're aware of more misattributions that they have not acknowledged in any print copies of these books. Well, can you send them a list? Uh, well, you know what? It's funny you say that, because I happen to know for a fact when uh, Concord Moon was operating as the representative for the Bruce Lee estate. They ordered a copy of my book, Dynamic Becoming. Ah. And I know this from, you know, from the publisher. They, yeah. they ordered it directly from the publisher. Um, so I know Shannon has seen what I wrote in that book. And that, that would have been the only reason that they had, you know, would be uh, driven to order the book is to look at those misattributions. And what I found is despite knowing that they ha have in possession my book um, and those initial misattributions that I had listed, which were, you know, two, 300 um, laid bare, they have con still continued to give Bruce Lee credit for a number of those things. Right. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. They can't say that they're blind to it. Right. But, but see, and anybody, anybody, anybody who, who hasn't gone through it yet, Right. When they do start going through the book and they do and they see, OK, here's where. In fact, you explain it because. Um, you, you said, I think it's in your introduction that sometimes uh, he, he took the whole quote. Sometimes he reworded the quote and then mm -hmm. sometimes he, he took he took like apart from here and apart from here and kind of moved them together. Right. Explain that. Yeah, so he would take bits and pieces from different quotes and kind of arrange them together into one quote. Um, and I'm, I'm, you know, I've used this term before. There's a there's a term in in literature called mosaic plagiarism, where a plagiarist will take bits and pieces from different sources and blend them together. Mm -hmm. um, now, mind you, most of the stuff in this book, he, you know, he did not publish this book. Right. So I'm, I'm a little hesitant to, to call it plagiarism, at least on Bruce's part here. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there are, there are passages there where, you know, it's one quote in the book Tao of Jeet Kune Do, but I found that the source for it was actually two or three books, you know, where he took a piece here, took a piece there and put them all together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, there are, there, are, there are a number of tables that you put in in the back of the book right. and uh this one was particularly interesting the word Tao appears once as yes. does the word Taoism. yes right so what you're talking about is at the end of the book i've done um some basic statistics yeah um, some, some frequency statistics to be honest 
uh, and I looked at the frequency of words is one, is one thing that I looked at. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, yeah, it only appeared once in the entire book. Now, I assume you, well, you, you can do that in Microsoft Word, right? You can find a word count. How did you do that? Um, well, I used some statistical tools that I have. Ah, please a, don't tell me it was my, it was Microsoft Excel. I hate Excel. Mm-hmm. Now the tables that you see, I generated in Excel. Uh, yeah, my student Glenn is going to love that. that. Okay, um, th- then the other thing, th- since we're talking word usage, did is I don't think there is one in the stats. Um, what about uh, word substitution? Like, like Zen substituted with Jikundo, boxer with fighter. Boxing yes. with, with, fencer or boxer was often changed to fighter. Uh huh. Um, you know, just to change to turn the the quote into a JKD quote or a martial art quote. Right. Um, uh, that was common. Um, yeah, he might. He, I can't remember if he switched out the word Zen, uh, but there are a number of words like that. One of it's, the most common is he changed right to left and vice versa. Oh, for sure. For sure, right. I did find. I, I did. I write it down. Um, I, I, I don't know if I wrote it down, but uh, I think I did find one where Zen was definitely uh, substituted for Jeet Kune Do. For sure, but I recall I, one one particularly interesting. There's a passage in there where he forgets to substitute a name for it, and it's a football a quote from a from a concerning football he has offensive passer ah really yes what section is that in i gotta make a note of that i can't well i could probably tell you hold on just a second let me do a quick search just look at my spreadsheet all right (laughs) that's that's funny that's on page 55 of the dao ji kundo says a habit of diffusing the attention over a wider area helps the offensive passer to, passer to see openings more quickly. Okay, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, let me. Page 55 of the Dow JKD. Okay. Yeah, and that was from the book, that was from the book, The Psychology of Coaching by John Lothar. That's a, that is a great book, isn't it? Apparently, he took a lot from Yeah, it. yeah, yeah. Um, and I, so, Again, this is why, like I told you, I'm over the moon with your book. So Hazlett was somewhat of a visionary because he was talking about people not having to go to college because they could study by computer and tape and, and, and what have you. Yes. Right. So in the book you're talking about in the book, I, I write a number of biographies of some of the people that are, responsible for the for the content of the Tao of Jeet Kune Do. Edwin Hazlett, obviously being one of the most important, because uh, he probably, outside of the philosophy stuff, has the lion's share of the quotes in the Tao of Jeet Kune Do. Mm-hmm. Um, so I did, I think it was a, maybe been a six-page biography on Hazlett. Yeah. Never been done before. It's the only place you'll find a biography of Hazlett. What, uh, I mean, which but is, in which my is, research, I found this where in... I think it was 1973, he wrote about his vision of education in the future. And Hazlett was a professor mm-hmm. um, at the University of Michigan, I believe it was. Minnesota. Minnesota. Yeah. Um, and in this explanation of his vision of the future of education, he basically talked about online learning. You know, before the Internet was a thing, before, you know, yeah, you know, computer-based learning was really a thing. He, he had a vision for it. Yeah. Do, do, you, do, you, do you think it's possible that, that, that Bruce Lee, um, well, why do you think Bruce Lee was, was, I mean, it seems to have been fascinated with Hazlitt's work, right? Yes. What, why, 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 why so, do you think? Well, I think he wasn't alone in thinking that. I think most boxers these days, especially scholars of boxing, probably cite Hazlitt's book as one of the most important in the, in the field. Uh, okay. So, you know, 
Bruce Lee was just recognizing um, how solid and scientific Hazlitt's approach was. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing to, that people may want to know too is that the U.S. Naval Boxing Manual, which you know w we all know Bruce Lee owned a copy of, mm -hmm. um, and we've probably all seen uh, at some point, uh, that was Hazlitt's work. He was the the boxing instructor for the pre-flight academy uh, of the U.S. Navy, and and he put together that book and some of the past, some of it he took, just took from his previous book. Uh, but what's interesting about the US Naval Boxing Manual is the, the person on the cover and on the inside demonstrating the techniques is Edwin Hazlett. And it's the only place you can see Edwin Hazlett actually practicing boxing, like a photograph of him. Yeah. Um, and his name is not on the book, you know, but I was, I made that, I recognize that because I did that biography on Hazlitt. It's got pictures. I'm be I've become familiar with his face. Mm -hmm. And then I go to the Naval Boxing book, you know, as I'm continuing my research and I go, oh my God, this is, it's, that's Hazlitt right, right, right there in the book. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, what, what do you think, why did Bruce Lee become fascinated with boxing? The science of it, I think. Ah. You know, he was looking for a scientific approach to fighting. And he came, he came over here to the U.S. and he, he saw how Western boxers were, you know, taking a very scientific approach, um, particularly not just to the, the, the boxing in the ring, but also in the preparation, the training that, that's involved. Right. Um, and um, I think he, well, I know Leo Fong, he may have turned him on to boxing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I heard that. Yeah. yeah. And in fact, um, one of the books that Leo Fong apparently recommended to him, because in Leo Fong, in his own personal story, he talks about how he was heavily influenced by a, by a book by Barney Ross called The Fundamentals of Boxing. Um, and when I read that in Leo's story, I mm -hmm. thought, well, I'm sure he recommended the book to Bruce. So I found, I located a copy of the book. And as soon as I got it, within five minutes, I was finding more quotes from the Dow G. Kundo. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. What what um what's the section? Is it is it Hazlett who wrote about uh no, it wasn't Hazlett. Who was it, if you can recall, that wrote about endurance and how much of it is lost the, the second that you stop working on it? Was that who was oh man. Uh no. well, I can search my handy dandy Excel spreadsheet again. <laughs> Makes it easy because I can just look up words. Right. Well, I know Frank Gilmer in his boxing book, Push Yourself, mentioned some yeah. stuff about endurance. Also, Lawrence Morehouse and Philip Rash in The Scientific Basis of Athletic Training talked about endurance. Yeah. That that push push yourself. It, it, it was a it, that was very intriguing. The one about punishing yourself during the workout and then recovering, then resting and recovering, and punishing yourself some more. I was like, man, that uh, that's that's brutal. Um, let's talk about. I found this out literally a few minutes before we went live. Okay, there was talk about publishing the Dao Ji Kundo as far back as 1968? Yes. Yeah, and you can see references to it in Black Belt Magazine. Now, I could never find a point in Black Belt Magazine's history where that initial announcement was made. What I found were people were writing in or the editors were mentioning that Bruce is working on it. Right. But it, it, it read as if it was already a known fact that he was playing in this book. So mm -hmm. I never found anywhere in Black Belt where it was it was sort of like Bruce Lee to write Tao of Jeet Kune Do, mm -hmm. right? Um, so it was, instead it was, you know, people writing in going, how's Bruce com coming along with the book? When's it going to be available? And right. you know, they would say, oh, it's gonna be available in a few months. Um, he, or, or he, you know, essentially it started to get stalled and people started to ask, when's this book coming? 
Um, and they initially got reassurances that Bruce was working on it. Mm-hmm. Um, but then eventually Black Belt acknowledged that Bruce had decided to show the book. Now, what what's the connection then between his idea for the Tao and then what became the fight and method? Were they supposed to go hand in hand? Do you know? Or Yeah, my understanding was, you know, the Tao Jeet Kune Do that we have now was Gilbert Johnson, the editor, taking a lot of Bruce's papers and distilling them down into a book. Right. The fighting method books were the material that Bruce was actually producing for his Tao of Jeet Kune Do. Those photos in there were meant to be the Tao of Jeet Kune Do. Um, uh, okay. And, and Mito at Black, at Black Belt, you know, simply produced the, the four book series with that material. Right. After the Dow Jeet Kune Do was released. In fact, I think that within a year apart, they both came out. Probably based on the success of the of the, yeah. the earlier. Well, I think it right. came so close uh, because I think the, the method books were that came out sometime in 76. So it had to be already, you know, in production mm-hmm. at that point because, mm-hmm. you know, the Dow of Jeet Kune Do came out in October 1975. Yeah. Um, okay. So talk to us about Snyder, because I don't think anybody's aware of him. Yeah. So in this book, uh, I, do a bio- I do a biography of, of Joe Snyder, Joseph Snyder. And he was the man for whom the acknowledgement at the beginning of a Dao Jeet Kune Do book, um, acknowledging those other authors, he's the reason that that exists. Um, he got the book in October 1975. Um, he was, I think at the time, I think he was 48 years old, um, and he had bought the book for his daughter, uh, who was taking karate, and so he heard this book was coming out, and he said, well, I'll get that book for my daughter, mm-hmm. and he gets it, and he starts reading it, and as he starts reading, he starts to recognize what turned out to be the work of Hazlitt, um, because when he was in the Army back in World War II, he bought Hazlitt's book, um, and then he happened to have it on the shelf, and he went over to the shelf, started thumbing through it, and recognized that there were passages there that were from the, the in the Tao of Jeet Kune Do that were taken from Hazlitt's book. So he began to do a little research, and he compiled this list, uh, you know, which I talk about in the book, of certain passages that were borrowed from other sources. And he reached out to um, Black Belt Magazine and to, um, to Linda, um, okay. which... I, my thinking is probably Mito was the one that actually received the communication, passed it along to Linda and Adrian Marshall, and Adrian Marshall contacted Joe Snyder. And he helped them a little bit with these um, initial uh, discoveries that he had made. Uh, and then they, they put the acknowledgement in, but they had to stop production of the book for a short time to go to those authors and get permission. Um, to continue using their work, right? Do, do you know the, if they do you know if they had any trouble getting that permission? I don't know. I've I've heard that Jack Dempsey wasn't too happy that his stuff was appearing in the book, but um, you know, but I, I don't know about the others. Uh, I I do think there was probably some frustration. I think Joe Snyder. You know, here's here's an interesting thing too that's been lost to history. Joe Snyder produced a cassette tape of interviews with some of those authors, like Hazlett and Crozier and those those types of guys, right. um, interviewing them about their work appearing in the Tao of Jeet Kune Do. And he tried to sell it for some reason. No copies exist. I don't know if he was successful trying to market the thing or not. But there was a there was an audio tape at one point that he had put together of his interviews with those authors, getting mm-hmm. their thoughts about their work appearing in Dow Jeet Kune Do. I've yet to find anybody that has a copy of it. Even Richard Torres doesn't have a copy of it. Well, then, and if he then, doesn't have a copy of it, then it's none exist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, do you have a favorite section? It, so, so when you when you started to find out stuff and and read stuff and what have you, was there a part of the book that became like your favorite section? 
Well, probably the philosophy stuff. I mean, that's initially why oh, right. I started yeah. doing this research. Right. I was I was looking at the philosophical writings of Bruce Lee and mm -hmm. trying to find their sources. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was the initial the initial uh, kind of goal right. I had in doing this research. But at some point, I realized, you know, I needed to stop temporarily that track and just look at the Tao of Jeet Kune Do um, because I thought. As, as I found enough there, I'm like, I really need to just concentrate on this yeah. and put together a definitive resource on the Tao of Jeet Kune Do to start. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, so initially the philosophy stuff was, were, were the things that I looked at in the Tao of Jeet Kune Do. Well, uh, it remains I'm, my favorite for obvious reasons. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a much more simple-minded guy than, than are you. Um, I love the grappling stuff. Yes, the pictures that you that you have in there that he yeah. that he drew. Oh my God, that's uh. Well, he that's... drew. He drew. He traced. Right. Right. Man. So, I, so in the book, I've just I've been able to identify almost all of the grappling stuff. There was a, a few judo things that eluded me, mm -hmm. um, but only maybe like two or three things. Yeah. I, some, some of the kicking stuff too is not in there, right? The kicking stuff. Yeah. That, that was probably the hardest thing to find. I found some kicking stuff, the stuff yeah. on, uh, on Savate. Right. I found, um, and then the, the purr kick, yeah. which that's, an, that's an interesting story. So the purr kick in there, what did he call it in the Tao of Jeet Kune Do? I've forgotten. He, it, it, so, so it's actually the Patagonia purr kick. Yes. He just called it the purr kick, I think. Well, he had, he had some other Or he called it Savat's purr kick. Yeah, he called it right? Savate's purr kick. And yeah. it, was not, it wasn't Savate's purr kick. In no. fact, it doesn't even exist. Right. And that's, that's the humor of this. It came right. from a book um, by John Gilby which was a pseudonym for Robert W. Smith and most martial arts scholars would know him as a, you know, a, uh, someone who contributed a lot of books to the subject of martial arts in the 1950s and 60s. Mm -hmm. um, but he wrote this book. It was a farce. He made up a lot of these techniques it's called, I think it's called uh, what secret fighting arts of the world or something like that. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and a lot of people didn't get the joke. They took it seriously. And apparently Bruce Lee was one of them. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a part in the Tao Ji Kune Do that, that per kick, uh, which in, in his, in, in Smith's book, he calls the Patagonian per kick, uh, which is complete fabrication. Yeah. Do, do, do people, do, do people take it seriously because of its similarity, I guess, to, um, to Drager's stuff? Maybe. Um, I think I think he Smith had, had gone on record after the book was published some years after that, that uh, he was surprised some people didn't get the joke. So he, he may have played it a little bit too seriously when he was writing right. it. Yeah. Yeah. But, so he wrote he wrote a follow up book, a sequel to it, which he, he kind of made it even more farcical. Right. So yeah. for the people who didn't get the joke the first time. <laughs> hey, there might have been. I think I think I used the technique from that book on a guy at, at school one time. So it wasn't completely useless. <laughs> All right. Um, so, yeah. So the the the, the kicking stuff, some of that you, you, you didn't you didn't get. Um, right. Right. And I, and I imagine a lot of that's probably in the Chinese language books. Um, ah. it might, it's a little harder to find right. here, although I did, I did find quite a bit, mm -hmm. um, you know, some, some of the stuff he wrote in Chinese in there, I was able to, um, identify the sources for. Okay. Um, like I said, I, I, I still have notes in my notebook from, <laughs> from being on the train earlier today. Um, is there a 100%, a well-known 100% original Bruce Lee quote? The one that immediately comes to mind is to change with change is the changeless state. Okay, that's 100% him. 
That one appears to be 100% Bruce Lee. And why I know that is because it was, he wrote that in a copy of a book he was reading. Okay. And I think if you go back to the old Nucleus newsletters, John did a, a an article on this. Okay. But you could see, you could see the page that he was writing it on. And it doesn't appear in the page. But what it appears to be is he was reading the content of the page and it gave him this thought. And so he wrote that thought up at, up at the top. Ah. Um, so it seems to be generated from his reading, but an original thought on the part of Bruce Lee. That one, that one I'm comfortable saying okay. was originally Bruce. Okay. Um, all right. So we got to let people know where and how to uh, get the book. Yeah, so the book's available right now. There's a limited edition hardcover that's available on my website, who wrote the Dow.com. Um, yeah, so you go it's, there. It's a great, I love hardcovers. It makes me feel erudite. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, next year, there'll, there'll be a paper book that comes out that'll be available at, the, at all the regular uh, book channels. Um, but this hardcover, you can only get through my website. Again, it's limited to 500 copies. Okay. Who wrote the Dow.com? Who wrote the Dow.com? Yes. Who built the website? Who wrote the Dow.com? I did. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. Right. How did you know? How did you know? Because I looked, I looked at it and I look at the, the, the logo, right? Mm-hmm and the size of the logo because it is the perfect size for a header when you're making a, and i go i bet you james did this himself because it looks a little bit like one of the websites that i'm working on okay because yeah. i because i have yeah, my, so, yeah it's a word it's a wordpress site you know but before i became uh before i became a, a, a psychotherapist and, and an educational psychologist i worked uh, I, I had a background in graphic design. Okay. I went to school, school for that initially. Yeah. Um, so I, I got those skills I use uh, quite a bit. I'm impressed by anybody who can build. Pay money. Website. I don't have to pay to yeah. have someone build a site for me. You know? Anybody who can build their own websites is my type of guy. I'm telling you. Yeah. I'm telling you. What theme did you use? Popular FX, I think, was the name of it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a it's a clean it's a clean site, um, mm -hmm. you know. I, I mean, it it's it really does a good job of. Most people are not impressed by websites. I am. So when I see the when I see the product and then I see the website that is that's there to promote the product, I'm like, man, these two things fit right together hand in hand, you know. Mm -hmm. Which was why, instead of finding other things, I for the postcard. For our little talk today, I just use those images because I love them. The, the, you know, the banner and, and everything was 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 perfect in in uh, in in my eyes. Are you going to do anything with? Um, let's see. There's brainy brainyquotes.com, goodreads.com, a to z quotes.com. Are you going to do anything with those people? Uh, don't plan on it. I, I don't, I think that's, um, that's an uphill battle there. Okay. Right. Yeah. You know, I could, I could point things out and maybe, or maybe not someone will remove them, but they'll just reappear you yeah. know, six months down the road. Um, because a lot of that stuff is, uh, um, you know, contributors from mm -hmm. outside, whoever's running the site. Or uploading that kind of stuff. Right. So, yeah. And I, think, I don't think there's one person deciding what what quotes appear on the website. So, you know, trying to stop Bruce Lee, false Bruce Lee quotes on the internet um, is a hard thing. To, <laughs> honestly, impossible. Now, yeah. occasionally, you know, I'll see something on a Facebook forum or group or something like that that I'll I'll offer the accurate information whether or not someone wants to take it or not and sometimes you know, very often like even in i love jeet kundo i find yes you know, I'll, I'll have people I'll, I'll i'll give them the correct information yeah they'll, they'll still want to quote it as bruce lee yeah we, we just went through that with the um the, and they'll make useful they'll, thing 
Yeah. And they'll right. make they'll make the argument that who does it matter who said it? Well, if that's well, the, if that's if that's the case, why are you insistent on it being Bruce Lee? Of course it matters. Of course yeah. it matters. I mean, what, what, you're, you're telling me now that 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 historical accuracy is a thing of the past. Mm -hmm. it, 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 th these things are no longer important. That's no. See, that's somebody. That's somebody who has no who has no answers for anything, right? So they want to deflect away the the the, the situation, right? And and yeah. I I the part that. The part that I don't understand, you tell me how you feel about this, is, well, it must have been something that he said because whatever and whatever. You know, you, that's very interesting. And I was just talking to uh, a fan who reached out to me today from the UK um, and brought, brought this up. I had that exact conversation with Matthew Pauly. When Matthew Pauly's book came out and I got it, and I read it and I noticed that that whole story about Bruce coming to the impasse in his training with Yip Man and then going out on the boat and having the epiphany, um, which in my book, Dynamic Becoming, I spelled out that this was plagiarized from Alan Watts. So, so much of it was taken wholesale from Alan Watts that right. it could not have actually happened in real life. And when I mentioned that to Pauly, Pauly said he had read my book. He was aware of it. But it was such a compelling story, and he figured something like that must have happened that he put it in there anyway. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. exactly what he told me. Yeah, like he knew it wasn't true. Right. But something like it must have happened. Right. So he yeah. he decided to put it in there anyway. Yeah, yeah, you know, and the the fact that I had done because when I discovered it, because I I believe for many years that absorb what is useful was a Bruce Lee quote. <clears throat> and when when the actual source was revealed to me and the background, I felt like I need to do a podcast on this. So mm -hmm. having done that, and then to have somebody who I figured had seen the podcast come back and say, oh, the, which is why I thought the reference was to the phrase dedicated to the free creative martial artists. Because I yeah. was sure everybody had everybody had become aware that absorb what is useful is not a Bruce Lee quote. So yeah, so they must so, have been talking about the other part. So for the audience who, who may not visit the I Love Jeet Kune Do group, um, absorb what is useful, discard what is useless, and add what is essentially your own is a quote from Mao Zedong, uh, former chairman, president of the of China, um, communist president. Uh, he it, it, I, I can tell you exactly where Bruce got the, got the quote, as, as I mentioned in I, on the I Love Jeet Kune Do group. Um, he got it from the Samuel Griff, Griffith translation of Sun Tzu's Art of War. Right. And in the introduction by um, Lydell Hart, I think was his name, uh, on page 55 of the book, he quotes Mao Tse um, with that exact quote. And that's yeah. where Bruce Lee had found it. And, you know, clearly he shared it with Dan um, and I, I imagine he shared it with his family and may or may not have shared it with other students, but it was it was not a Bruce Lee quote. Yeah. Obviously, he found some value in it. Uh, and I think it actually does a great job of explaining Bruce Lee's own process in developing Jeet Kune Do, because that's exactly what he did. Mm -hmm. Now, did he want other people? to further develop Jeet Kune Do with the same process? I, I, I don't think so. Yeah. Um, but I think that that statement, absorb what is useful, discard what is useless, and add what is essentially your own, is exactly what Bruce Lee did in his development of Jeet Kune Do. Right, yeah. Um, do you know anything about, so it appears in the art of war, do you know anything about the original being uh, in a Mao Zedong book on a protracted war, titled On a Protracted War? Do you know yes. That? Yeah. And, and I have found it. You can actually find it online. There's a, I know there's a website that has that, that passage from, from that book. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I initially found that. And I think the, it, that book was written probably 1928, I think it was. I, uh, um, 
Mao Zedong's book. Yeah. Um, you know, so I, I confirmed that it came from Mao Zedong, but it wasn't until I came across the passage in Samuel Griffith's version of Sun Tzu's Art of War that I that I realized this is exactly where Bruce got it because the term, the translation of it was exact mm -hmm. to the translation that we see. Right. And I also knew that Bruce Lee, in fact, owned that version of Sun Tzu's Art of War. Right. And as I mentioned in the I Love Jeet Kune Do group, um, I found seven other cases of quotes from that book attributed to Bruce Lee in Jeet Kune Do commentaries on the Marshall Way. So I know he took other things from that book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, doesn't it make sense in a world of no internet, not even a vision of the internet, but in a world of books, doesn't it make sense to read and make your notes on stuff? Yeah, you it know? makes perfect sense. All right. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm I don't, I don't fault him for that, you know? Yeah, I, I, I don't see, I don't see why anyone, I don't see why anyone would. Um, Until you start taking credit for those things, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Which, you know, with the Tao of Juke Do, we can say that, you know, that's not Bruce's fault, that that's the estate that has responsibility for that. Um, but as we talked about before, there are other things that Bruce did, in fact, publish and plagiarize. Right. Um, yeah. Which I've been able to identify, including his, his only published book, uh, Chinese Gung Fu, The Philosophical Art of Self-Defense, has a good number of plagiarisms in it. Um, you had mentioned before uh, the study in the study of, of um, I forget how you put it, extra extra smart people. Was it? I forget what it. What you said. Gifted and talented people is the yeah. is um, get, gifted and talented education um, or high potential uh, okay. is the kind of the name of the field that that I that I'm in. Yeah. And, and I, I'm trying to remember if, if I tried to ask you about this gentleman the last time, the first time we spoke. Do you know Gene Landrum, uh, the author of Profiles Profiles of Power and Success? No. No? Dr. No. Gene Landrum? Okay. No. I'd be, I'd, it, it, it's, it's funny how these coincidences happen. Um, I knew I was going to be talking to you. I started to think about him. He lives in Naples, Florida. So he was on my mind. Yeah, right. He was on my mind. The storm hits Naples. I, I know I have to, to talk to you about him. It's just just real just really, really weird. Um okay, I so I think I might be I think I might have um a PDF of his I'll send it to you. I think yeah, he, please might, do. he might, yeah, Gene Landrum. He's uh he's done a number, a number of books on on uh super intelligence um so 85 percent success rate in locating yeah. stuff yeah so, so yeah my book identifies probably 85 percent of the sources of the Tao of jeet kundo like okay, i said so the kicking going? stuff you know still still largely unidentified um you know, passages here or there. I think there's at least one more boxing book and one more fencing book okay. that I've yet to discover. Okay. Um, and um, yeah. And so, so you will. And, go then, and then the stuff them. that remains, you know, a lot of the stuff that remains are simple stuff that really doesn't lend itself for identification. Like here's a list of the, of the exercises. Or, you know, here's a list of, the types of punches, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. that's, it's, it's just a list. It's, yeah. it's not something yeah. that you can trace back to a source. Yeah. So will there, you, you didn't, you didn't mark this volume one. So what happens next? I think if I, if I find enough, um, I think probably somewhere down the road, maybe three, four years down the road, I might do a revised edition. Okay. Oh yeah. Um, I discovered, I, you know, I was finding things, um, you know, 
even as I'm laying out the book, I was finding things. So I expect to find more. Okay. okay. Um, you know, and there may even be people out there that, you know, they read the book, and they go, oh, I know of one thing you, you yeah. missed in the book. They might bring it to my attention. Um, but 85% is a pretty good number. Um, I can't say that the other 15% is definitively Bruce Lee. Mm-hmm. But I can't say the fact that I didn't find it improves the chances that it is. Right. Yeah. You know, I, 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 have, I, have, a, I have a good friend um, up in North Florida named Joseph Powell, who um, I can remember back in the late 1980s, he had told me that he was trying to find, I think at the, at the time we knew about, I think we knew about Hazlitt's book. We knew mm-hmm. that you're right, and and he was he was trying to um to 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 find it. I th- he'll probably watch this and and um and he'll he'll let me know. Um, okay, we should, we should get you, the book then. He'll be happy. Oh yeah, he no, he will. He definitely will. Um, are you working on anything else outside of the martial art field, like book wise? Yeah, there's uh, one book. Um, I've been dragging my feet on uh, about um, it's a book for parents of children, gifted children with anxiety. Um, so I'm working on that. Um, I'm doing a book of quotations for the field of giftedness and talent. Nice. Um, and I got a couple other things that I'm, I'm developing. Well, so. you're certainly, you're, you're certainly never not busy, huh? No, I'm always keeping busy. And I've got <laughs> other projects, I've got video projects. I've got, a video I'm wrapping up just this evening, and I'll probably release tonight. Um, it's a 20 minute video of, of uh, my take on the concepts versus original debate. Um, or is that something we get to see? Yeah, it'll be posted on YouTube. I'll, I'll let okay. you know when, when okay. it's out. Yeah. I'll, I'll announce it. Um, it's, I think there'll be stuff for both groups to uh what, what's the title to appreciate, of, to appreciate what, in it what, probably what's the title of it the never ending battle <laughs> well yeah yeah i think i think you'll you'll both appreciate and, and and equally be um offended by some of the things i have to say in there probably oh i love it already <laughs> i love it already all right well listen you you got stuff to do i appreciate your being flexible since we have to push this to uh, a Monday evening from last Friday. Um, so yeah, when um, whenever else you want to come back and talk, man, I, lo- I, I love I love getting a chance to pick your brain on stuff. Right? Sure. So Here, I'll, here's one ahead. tip I want to I want to give everybody. Yeah. Okay. Um, if in a le- in a letter Bruce Lee wrote, a sentence starts with "Remember, my friend." What follows is going to be plagiarism. Okay. Interesting. If you're reading a letter from Bruce Lee and he says, remember my friend, okay. what follows, he will have plagiarized. I'm going to, I'm going to, wait, I think, I get it. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to go check right now. Yeah. <laughs> All right. James Bishop, thank you so much, man. Have a great evening and we'll talk again. You too. Take care. All right. Take care. Right. Bye bye. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Episode number 241 with James Bishop. So go to who wrote the Dow.com where you can order. There's only 500 of them being, um, being printed up so you can get your, 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 um, hardcover. Uh, otherwise wait until, uh, the paperback stuff comes out, but really, really fascinating, really, really interesting to, um, to lay them out side by side and, and just go through stuff. Um, I don't like to write in my hardcover books, so, but I'm really tempted to, uh, but I'll, 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 I'll wait, I'll wait, right? Okay, so um, today's Monday, in a couple of days, we'll do um, the I Love Jeet Kune Do broadcast, and then on, um, on Friday, uh, do I have it here? Oh, I don't have, I don't have it at hand. Um, let me see if I can pull it up quickly, quickly, quickly. Coming up on Friday on the dialogues will be um i don't have it here with me it's not on this computer so anyhow okay so that's it for today uh, you guys um any comments you have i'll ask james to go through them 
And if there's anything that he or I need to answer, we'll go ahead and do that. Um, so until Wednesday uh, on the broadcast and this Friday on the next episode of the Dialogues, this is Dwight Woods, the Jeet Kune Do Rebels, signing off. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Talk soon. Take care.